Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, April 10th, 2008. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, chemistry professor Brad Sturgeon joins us to explain the science of skunking. Why does our beer occasionally and tragically take on the flavor and aroma of monochromatic roadkill? And more importantly, what can we do to prevent it? Well, if you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. Well, this week I've started playing with another element of technology to uh, add to my already way too connected life. My uh, my buddies Kelly Dodson and Andy Sparks have they've worn me down. They've been bugging me to start using Twitter. <laughs> if you don't if you don't know what Twitter is, don't feel bad. I'm I'm not sure exactly what I've gotten myself into uh, myself. Um, but go to twitter.com slash basic brewing and check it out. Um, essentially, Twitter is a way for people to connect using little short messages. And you can choose to have those messages from people that you select sent to your mobile device as SMS messages. Or you can be like me and just check the web page for updates. Because that's all I need is another beeping thing or vibrating thing. Uh Connecting me. <laughs> so, um, so what does that mean to you? If you join Twitter, which is free, and choose to follow Basic Brewing, which is me, you'll see periodic updates whenever I put a little message out there. Now, this can be useful to let you know, uh, for instance, when I'm posting a new show, or if I need questions for a guest, or if I'm at a beer bar and need to know what what kind of beer to buy if I'm unfamiliar with brands or something. Who knows? It might be fun. Um, right now I'm treating this as an experiment, so it may not last forever, but it might. You know, I was skeptical about podcasting at first. And now look at us. Um, so anyway, Twitter, twitter.com slash basicbrewing. Let's take a look into an older form of communication, email. The Pony Express of uh, digital communication now. Last week I spoke to Matt Kirkegaard of Beer and Brewer magazine in Australia, and uh, I mentioned Graham Sanders' name, and Graham wrote in and said, uh, you couldn't help yourself, could you? The little stir that you are. <laughs> you had to try and bait him on the term craft brewer. And uh, Graham says, I thought he handled it nicely and politically correctly. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I, I think that uh, Graham and I both agree that Matt has a future in politics if he ever decides to forego the uh, journalism career. And uh, also, Graham says, stop trying to pinch our hops. So <laughs> you can uh, you can hear Graham. He's been doing this thing, this kind of thing, way longer than any of us in the, uh, the beer podcasting thing. You can hear him on Craft Brewer Radio. Ed in Waterntown, uh, South Dakota writes, I just wanted to let you know that I got back from a very long car trip to visit prospective graduate schools for the next year. I was still mucking around in the archives after brewing for nearly a year, so I decided to put BBR in overdrive. On my drive from South Dakota to Syracuse, New York, with plenty of stops along the way, I listened to over one year of BBR, nearly 40 hours in total. Ed says, I'm now completely caught up and will never miss podcast contests like the Brewing Belt Contest again. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> That's a lot of time to be spending uh, listening to us. I'm glad you survived, Ed. Uh, Ed says, the uh, the best part about the 10-day excursion is that because I brewed shortly before I left, I now have a, a Hefeweizen and a, a Whitbeer kegged ready for the spring and summer. That's great. Uh, by the way, I, I spent a few hours this past weekend uh, brewing up an experiment comparing three base malts, Maris Otter, American Two-Row, and Belgian Pale Ale. And you can look for the results of that on an upcoming uh, video podcast, a basic brewing video. You know, we did a, an episode not too long ago comparing specialty grains, and so I was curious about comparing some 
base malts side by side. And basically, the only way to do that properly is to to mash them and ferment them. So there you go. Tom Schmidlin, former uh, former beer drinker of the year, wrote in when he heard my stumbling all over the terms uh, whole leaf hops versus whole flower hops. Tom says they're not the flowers either. They're the, the fruiting body of the plant and are cones, much like a pine cone is the fruiting body of some trees. If you grow your own hops, you can see the flowers on the plant. On my cascades, they're kind of spindly-looking things, very pale greenish-yellow. That's a good point, Tom. Yes, you, you can. If you grow your own hops, you can see these little spiky-looking things uh, coming out on the hop vine shortly before the hop cones come in, and I guess those are actually the flowers of the of the hops. Tom says, Norm, who wrote earlier in an earlier episode, Norm is right that bracteoles are a kind of leaf, but I think it leads to confusion to call them leaf hops. Tom says it's sort of like riding in a boat 500 feet underwater. You really want a submarine and not just any old boat, <laughs> even though a submarine is technically a boat by some definitions. You really want the hop cones, not just any old leaves off the plant, even if the cones are technically leaves by some definitions. Tom says all of these are, are technically correct. Whole specialized leaf hops, whole bracteole hops, whole cone hops, and whole fruiting body hops. But Tom says, I think you're right. I just call them whole hops, too. <laughs> I appreciate that from Tom. You know, you know you're a beer brewer or beer lover when uh, you get that tied up in the terminology of beer ingredients. And uh, Tom finally says, uh, don't even get me started about wet hopped beers because the hops aren't wet. They're fresh. No one makes pesto out of wet basil or serves a Belgian waffle with wet strawberries. Do they? No, they're fresh. <laughs> I appreciate that, Tom. It's great stuff. In fact, it's got me thinking about another chance for you guys to write in. What is your biggest pet peeve? in misunderstanding or misinterpreting beer terminology. Let me, let me give you another one. Andy Sparks really gets cheesed when he hears somebody say, ooh, that beer is too stout. <laughs> Andy has to remind him that stout is a style, not a description. So, what gets you going? Drop me a line and let me know. James at basicbrewing.com or just use the contact form on basicbrewing.com and I'll I'll see if I can round up, uh, round up some, some prizes or something in the meantime. Okay, let's get into our interview. The other day, when we were shooting the Hop Trellis episode at Andy's house, we were drinking some Avery Maharaja, which is a really hoppy and wonderful beer. And even though it was cloudy, the character of that beer became skunky just after a few minutes. Well, this week, our chemistry professor buddy, Brad Sturgeon from Monmouth College, gives us a peek into the science of skunking and what we can do to prevent it. Well, Brad Sturgeon, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Uh, thanks, James. It's great to be here. We are going to talk today about uh, a subject that is near and dear to uh, home brewers and beer lovers' hearts, skunking, and what go what goes on in the background. and. And what causes it, and, and how can we prevent it? And uh, I understand that you've been doing some research into that topic lately. Well, I've been doing a lot of reading and also uh, looking into things about uh, protection of a beer from glass or from the uh, different uh, forms of electromagnetic radiation or light. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a really very, very interesting chemistry topic. And uh, to tell you the truth, it looks like in the literature they have this worked out pretty well. Um, <laughs> yeah, they uh, they seem to, uh, first off, I mean, there's a lot of old literature that talks about this being observed back in like 1875 uh, where you get this skunky <laughs> aroma. Uh, people have isolated uh, the compound that they think is responsible for that. And then there's a number of folks who have done some pretty high-level uh, sort of uh, biochemical reactions and instrumentation to detect and to determine the all this chemistry that's going on. So um, it's a good topic, uh, but to the home brewer, there's still a lot of uh, a lot of uncertainties that go on. And actually, there are quite a few in the literature as well. So, 
Well, I, we'll try to clear up some of those uncertainties, and and I'll try to to throw in some of the questions that I've gotten over time about skunking in there. And uh, I don't know if you've seen the uh, Basic Brewing video episode where Steve and I were sitting out on the patio. Uh, oh, doing, yeah. doing our little skunking experiment, but uh, we got some pretty dramatic results from our little, uh, you know, scientific experiment. So uh, you can uh, do your own experiment at home, get a hoppy beer, put it out in the direct sunlight, wait a few minutes, and then you pretty much have the results right there. Yeah, well, I, I did watch that episode when it came out, and, and it essentially stimulated me to get in the lab and think about this. Uh, I, I figured it has to be a chemistry problem, so uh, <laughs> I dug through the literature, and sure enough, there was a lot of stuff in there. So, so what what is skunking? What causes that nasty skunky taste? Yeah, well, it's been known for quite a while, and that's probably a uh, hundred or more years that only beers that contain hops um, have a uh, level of skunkiness to them. So they've associated the the uh, isomerized alpha acid with the hop component. And essentially what it is, when you look at the molecule, the iso alpha acid, and it turns out that all three of the iso alpha acids are equally sensitive to the same chemistry. So we, in this uh, terms of skunking, we just talk about all three of them as, as one group. Um, but there's one particular bond in that molecule that is susceptible to being cleaved uh, due to light. Uh, and so that light can, when it shines onto an isomerized alpha acid, it can essentially break that chemical bond. There's a series of other steps that go on, one of them being uh, this, what we call a radical, something with an unpaired electron, reacts with a compound that has sulfur in it, and you make what's called a thiol. And a thiol is like an alcohol. It's, an alcohol is an OH. A thiol is an SH. And it turns out that those are very odiferous, maybe, should we say? <laughs> <laughs> so, and actually, there's been some studies as far as the uh, olfactory uh, sensitivity. And they say that if you had like four nanograms of this uh, thiol, which is 3-methylbutene-1-thiol, uh, which is abbreviated MBT, uh, if you had four nanograms, and the nano is 10 to the minus ninth, so there's a very, very tiny bit of this material, and we could perceive it very easily. So, you know, that may be something with skunk beers, is that we think there's all this nasty, awful stuff in there. Well, it just happens to be that we have a sensor that uh, is very, very sensitive to that compound. And so there's not a whole lot there, but... We're very, very sensitive to it. So, is this actually the same chemical compound that gives the skunks rear end that smell? Uh, well, not exactly. Well, actually, James, I don't know exactly what the skunk <laughs> does. Uh, you caught me there. Although, yeah, these these types of thiols, which are also referred to as mercaptans, um, are commonly used. Like, for instance, the smell of propane. Uh, you can't smell propane. You actually smell the mercaptan that they put in there so that you can sense the smell when you do have a propane leak. So um, it could very well. It's a very simple compound, and so I wouldn't be surprised if it was the exact compound from a skunk, but uh, I can't be for certain. Now you keep mentioning isomerized alpha acids. I, I guess we should remind those who are new to brewing that alpha acids get isomerized during the boil, and they're actually chemically changed by the boil. Now, I've gotten the question, why don't hops uh, skunk while they spend all that time in the sunshine on the vine? Or if you're setting your hops out in the sun on the table, on the patio beside you, say, as you're brewing, why aren't they affected by sunlight? Is it because just straight alpha acids that aren't isomerized yet aren't affected? Yeah, I don't know of any particular research that is focused on just alpha acids and their ability to form this MBT compound. Uh, but when I look at the, the molecular structure of it uh, and compare it to the isomerized alpha acid, it's not a whole lot different. It has a lot of characterization or character that's the same. But, you know, you are going from a six-membered carbon ring in the alpha acid and going to a five-membered carbon ring 
and the isomerized alpha acid. So it's very likely that there is some different energetics involved there. But um, it appears as though it might be susceptible to some of the same photochemistry uh, that would result in skunking. Um, again, there's a number of sort of parameters. Like if you have a pellet, uh, you're talking about if it's sitting outside while you're brewing, you're talking about maybe surface effects. Uh, you're not really able to reach deep down inside that pellet because it's opaque. Uh, and then also with a flower, you sort of have that same protection from the uh, the petals on the flower. Um, uh, one other thing is that, you know, when you're using those hops then uh, in a full boil, some of these... Um, uh, thiols that maybe form could just be volatile and they could leave the beer so you may not see them at the time but I think it's best to, to err on the side of uh, caution although as as you have uh, professed all along unless you have a problem don't change yeah. <laughs> if it ain't broke don't fix it as we say down here um, now I've brewed some hoppy beers out on the patio and the brew pot has been in the full sun, and I've gotten the question, if I'm brewing a beer out on the patio, should I put an umbrella over it while I'm brewing? And, um, you know, when I got that question from someone, I had to kind of scratch my head on that one. Because when I brew out on the patio, I may be under an umbrella, but my brew pot may not be. And, you know, I've got a rolling boil going, and I've got hops in there boiling away, and those alpha acids are isomerizing. So what's up with that? Do you have a best guess on, on why our beers don't get skunky necessarily, being boiled out in the full sun? Yeah, well, I guess we could have it as a rule of thumb is if you get an umbrella, then your beer does too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, well – Let's let's just talk about the sources of light that can cause this, and the sun is, of course, the the biggest one. And you know, when you go outside in the sun, uh, the sun is producing a fair amount of ultraviolet radiation, and so um, you know, we protect ourselves by putting on sunscreen or wearing a brimmed hat or hanging out underneath an umbrella. Um, I guess I would try to do the same thing for my beer. Um, you know, I have a tendency to brew kind of bigger ales, and so if I have some off flavors, maybe that's why I stick with those. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I can protect myself there. But, um, yeah, I, I, I would guess just from a chemistry standpoint, there's a lot of uh, a lot of that same chemistry that it has in a beer that's been put in a bottle um, also could happen during brew time. Uh, but I think we just got to do the experiment, I'd guess. You talked about sources of light. Are there certain wavelengths of light that are the ones to kind of look out for? Ah, that's an excellent question uh, because it's one of the things that's not real clear in the science literature right now. Um, just as a little background on, on light, essentially, um, we categorize light based on what its wavelength is. And you can think of the wavelength as sort of the – the separation between the waves, if you want to think at the beach, you know, the wavelength there is about three meters. Uh, something like red light has a wavelength of 650 nanometers. So, again, there's that nanometer. It's 10 to the minus ninth. So it's a very small wavelength. Uh, visible light is in the 400 to 700 nanometer range. And then things below 400, maybe down to 280 nanometers, is considered ultraviolet. Um, you know, we want to put on sunscreen to protect against ultraviolet. We want to wear sunglasses uh, to protect against ultraviolet. And that's because ultraviolet light is a higher energy light and can cause a lot of a lot of problems. I mean, it can damage our skin and it can also damage our isomerized hops. Um, actually, uh, yeah, so it's kind of strange. We don't talk about the energy of the wavelength, but we talk about it in terms of its wavelength. Uh, the reason I like to think in terms of energy is that the unit we use in chemistry is called the joule. And it turned out that uh, this guy Joule was a brewer back in the uh, 1860s, and he became obsessed with this concept of the amount of energy it needed. he needed to bring a spring volume of water up to a certain temperature. And uh, he was just totally obsessed and essentially 
uh, a very large collection of thermodynamics about this heat transfer and all this stuff came from Joule, uh, who who was really a brewer at heart, but just wanted to do such a good job. So had to put that uh, little plug in for for my friend Jewel there. So so <laughs> so once again, beer has made a significant contribution to society. Oh heck yeah, <laughs> that's right. So so okay. So you you originally ask is so as far as the wavelength of light, um, the higher the energy, the more problematic it is. So things in the UV range, which are below 400 nanometers, uh, are problematic. Now, there's a real nice study done by a colleague of mine at um, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, uh, Malcolm Forbes, uh, has done some uh, chemistry where you, you can actually see the isomerized alpha acid break apart. You can detect the radicals. And you can identify those radicals using a special technique called electron spin resonance. Um, he used um, a wavelength of light around 300 nanometers in order to physically break that bond in the isomerized alpha acid. Um, there are a number of other papers that are out there that says anything between sort of 350 nanometers and 500 nanometers um, can also do the same chemistry. And it's interesting when you think of something like a 500 nanometer wavelength of light, it really doesn't have enough energy to cleave the bond in that isomerized alpha acids. So what some folks have done, and they've done some real nice studies on this, where they've added in this compound called riboflavin. Hmm. And again, you can wiki riboflavin, and it's just a, um, uh, it's a molecule that shows up in beer. Uh, it's, it's, it shows up, it's from a natural source. And what riboflavin can do, uh, it's called a photosensitizer, which means that it can absorb light maybe in the 500 nanometer range. And then what it can do is I can do the chemistry as if it had the energy associated with a 300 nanometer wavelength. So this is this concept of, of photosensitization that, that uh, kind of comes into play. If you have a lot of riboflavin, then wavelengths other than the high-energy UV can form skunking, uh, can break up your isomerized alpha acids to form the MBT, uh, the skunk aroma. Huh. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's fairly complicated how that works, and I think some of your folks have written in... Uh, uh, talking about the triplet state and all sorts of stuff. And that is that is essentially how riboflavin works. Uh, I won't go into the, to the details unless you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, this other compound that's naturally occurring in the beer can help wavelengths of light that aren't usually susceptible to helping the skunking problem. Uh, this compound can facilitate skunking even if those wavelengths aren't optimal for skunking isomerized alpha acids is, is that what i'm hearing that's exactly right oh, sure. yeah okay. <laughs> yep riboflavin yeah and actually what's so amazing and again what keeps me uh, invigorated about chemistry and science in general is that uh, riboflavins are used by many different uh, biomolecules and other bioprocesses uh, and somehow they control this uh, in order to get their job done. In this particular case, I would say that it's kind of a, uh, a side effect that is not desirable. Mm. Uh, you, you might imagine also that I'm starting to look into ways of determining riboflavin concentration in my beers because I want to see how that may, uh, may play out in our ability to skunk beer. So. Now, continuing on with the, uh, the topic of light, uh, we know that sunlight is a bad one. But uh, what other sources of light? I mean, we've got incandescent light, fluorescent light, I guess sodium vapor light is another one to watch out for. Are there any good ones, and are there especially bad ones? Yeah. Well, I, when you talk about sodium vapor lights, I think of you brewing late night out under the stars, right, with the the uh, street lamps going. Uh, or in a uh, gym. I, or in a gym. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, uh, that's right. I don't know so much about those, except for I do know that sodium has an uh, it has emission lines, or it produces 
uh, light that's about 588 nanometers. Uh, so it's kind of a not as strong, uh, not as highly energetic. Uh, so I'm kind of guessing at that one. Um, but the, a standard um, incandescent or like a tungsten bulb uh, generally produces light in the 400 to 700 nanometers. Uh, so from a chemistry standpoint, that does not have enough energy to break the bonds in an isomerized alpha acid, although with the addition of riboflavin and other, photo, uh, other potential photosensitizers, even just standard... Uh, your standard uh, tungsten light bulb could cause some skunking. So I got an email from someone who said, I'm terrified because I left the basement light on all night and my carboy is down there in the basement. Should I be worried? And my answer to him was, well, from what from what I've read, it's if it's just an incandescent light bulb, you shouldn't have to worry. But if it's a fluorescent light bulb, uh, is that more of a source of worry? Uh, yes, it is. Um, and um, one of the things I did in preparation for this this talk here is I did go into the lab and measured some of the uh, what we call the emission spectra or the wavelengths of light that come from different light sources. And um, I think uh, I will send you something very shortly, and you can get it up on on your web page. But one of the things about fluorescent lights that is a problem is that you have to go back to understand how a fluorescent light works. Uh, you know, in a standard tungsten light bulb, you put electrons through the tungsten wire, and as it gets really hot, it glows a bright white or kind of first starts off kind of a yellowish orange and then kind of bright white. Well, in a fluorescent light bulb, you have uh, a gas inside of that tube, but then you also have mercury vapor. And so in the same way that tungsten gets excited and emits light in an incandescent bulb, uh, a fluorescent light, the mercury gets excited and emits uh, e mercury emission lines. And when you look at those uh, with a spectrometer, again, that will be on your webpage here, you see that there are some rather intense um, wavelengths of light that are being emitted. Um, the way the fluorescent bulb works also is that those emission lines from mercury actually hit the what they call the phosphor, the white powdery stuff on the inside of the of the fluorescent tube, and that kind of broadens the wavelength and kind of makes it a little smoother, a little bit softer light. Um, but you know, if you're a beer sitting on a shelf inside of a cabinet in a refrigerator uh, in the store, and you have these fluorescent lights on it. Um, you know, there can be a pretty intense uh, wavelength of light in the less than 500 nanometers, mm. which, uh, you know, with riboflavin present and all, uh, you can get quite a bit of uh, photochemistry happening at that point. So fluorescent lights, I think, are a problem. Um, and again, it's uh, when you look at this spectrum that's being generated, there's a very intense wavelength that's at about 430 nanometers and uh, that those wavelengths are are flying at your beer bottle so in a way this movement to replace your incandescent bulbs with compact fluorescent bulbs may be better for the environment but not so good for the beer I'm afraid uh, yeah that's its downfall uh, yes so let, let's talk about ways that we can protect our beer First of all, what I do is I, I put my beer in my basement, and I think I still have an incandescent bulb down there. I'm, I'm going to have to check after talking with you. But in addition to that, what I do is, is take a paper grocery sack, and I cut a little hole in the bottom of it uh, just big enough for the carboy's neck to fit through, and it, and it fits nicely over a five-gallon uh, glass carboy. Um, you know, it's too small for a... a a uh, six and a half gallon carboy, but it's big. It's good for a five gallon carboy. So, the first strategy, I guess, is is to protect your beer from the light. Um, you can just cover it up. But uh, once it gets into the bottle, what you choose for the color of your bottle can be influential in how your beer fares as it's being stored. Right? Uh, yeah, and that was part of the data that I collected in preparation for this program here, and. Um, as uh, you might expect, uh, I, I, I collected a series of data using the sun 
and having it filtered with different beer bottles, um, and then also uh, tungsten light and a fluorescent light. I have all that set of data that will be posted on your web page. And you actually took beer bottles and put this little um, sensor inside them and carried them to uh, different lighting conditions? That's right, except for I, I just smashed the bottle up <laughs> and uh, and took a little shard and placed it over the input the uh, where the light goes in uh, for this uh, spectrometer that can separate out these wavelengths of light so we can get an idea of, of what's all in that that uh, light emitting from a particular source. Um, uh, so I, so there's essentially uh, four different bottles that I tested. Um, a clear bottle um, pretty much did nothing as far as filtering any light from any of the sources. So even that goes for the UV light that maybe it's uh, that's generated from the sun. Uh, a clear glass bottle will not block any of those UV rays. Now, after our video show where we did skunking out on the patio, I got a listener who said, I, um, I hate to correct you, but uh, all of your bottles were clear, but uh, you're talking about colorless glass instead of clear glass. Okay, colorless. That's right. So <laughs> like a Newcastle uh, is the bottle that I broke up and used for that one. So, so I didn't see any attenuation of wavelengths from any of the sources that I looked at using colorless glass. Uh, now, the other uh, more commonly seen is the green bottle. Um, the green bottle, um, let me see, I check my notes here. Um, when I was looking at just a, um, a tungsten bulb, just a standard incandescent light, when uh, we were at a wavelength of about 400 nanometers, there was about a 76% percent, excuse me, 76 percent attenuation of that light. So when you're down into 400, this is still, you know, right on the edge of UV light. A green glass actually does an okay job of um, attenuating the light up to about, say, 450 nanometers or so. Um, the blue glass, hmm. which I don't know of too many people who actually bottle in blue glass except for some sort of special occasion, um, but it actually was significantly worse than the green glass. Really? And that, yeah, that even at that 400 nanometers where green light attenuated that wavelength by about 76%, it essentially took out three-fourths of the light, the blue glass only filtered about a quarter of that. Huh. Um, so, so you're still getting those wavelengths into your beer, even though the blue glass that I had was, you know, was pretty dark and kind of a rich color. Uh, compared to the green, I mean, you could clearly see through the green more than you could the blue. Uh, but as far as those uh, lower wavelengths and near the UV range, uh, the green glass was actually doing a much better job. Well, that's surprising to me because I've, I've seen some pretty blue bottles in the homebrew store, and, and they're pretty dark. And one would assume that because they're dark, they would block more light, but apparently not, huh? Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess uh, the way that works, I guess, is if a bottle's blue, that means it absorbs just about everything else except for blue, um, and so it means it can transmit blue light because otherwise you wouldn't be seeing the blue coming out of the bottle or reflecting off the bottle. Um, so blue is on the lower end, uh, sort of on the 400 to 500 nanometer wavelength, so... It, it makes sense to me chemically that it would uh, allow those to be transmitted through it uh, in those sort of low visible or um, higher uh, UV ranges. So. so how did our hero the brown glass bottle do? We're always telling people to use brown bottles to prevent skunking. And are we telling people the correct information? Uh, yeah, pretty much so. Um, uh, I made some reference to a 400 nanometer uh, wavelength with the tungsten sort of incandescent bulb um, at the 400 nanometers, the brown glass absorbs everything. There yeah. is no no emission uh, through brown glass. Uh, when I step up to 450 nanometers, 
again, 100% um, uh, blocking of that light. And even up to 500 nanometers, I'm about 96, 97% attenuating that light passing through. Wow. Um, so a brown bottle is a, is a pretty safe bet. Although, again, when we start to bring in this concept of the riboflavin and photosensitizing, they're talking about 500 nanometer wavelengths being able to cause some of this photochemistry leading to the skunky off flavor mm. and off aroma. So, um, you know, again, I don't want to make people paranoid, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, but even the brown bottle starts to allow some light to pass through once you get above 500 nanometers sort of peaking around 650 or so around in the red range because uh, that brown is kind of red. So and you got to think that time is certainly a factor. If you have if you have a certain unpopular beer that's sitting in the fluorescently lit beer fridge of the store, if it's in there for an extended period of time, you've got more chance for that beer to be skunked, right? That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and another result, when I went out with the sun and uh, – use the different bottles again the brown glass was was very good of attenuating almost all of the wavelengths before or below say 450 and again it's around 500 is when it starts to allow uh, 500 nanometers when it allows light through uh, but the the blue and the green uh, and the clear excuse me colorless <laughs> uh, were uh, certainly allowing large amounts of the UV light to actually pass through the bottle. Mm. Um, so there was very, very little um, protection from the UV light sources from the green and the blue and the colorless, whereas the brown pretty much attenuated all those UV rays at that point. So the big question, and the question that Steve asked me on our video podcast, and of course I had no idea, if you have a beer in a colorless bottle, like a Newcastle or Corona, why aren't those beers skunked? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, the, uh, the the Newcastle that I opened that I, I had left over and sat, I think, since Christmas, actually, uh, was clearly skunked. Ah, there you go. Uh, then you Then you have some people... Uh, I actually know somebody who likes a certain um, green bottled European beer, and uh, he actually says that when he drives by a dead skunk on the side of the road, he gets thirsty for a beer. So, so clearly there are some beers out there who do or that do get skunked. But um, from what I've heard, there are some beers like Corona that use a hop extract, and they say that that isn't as easily skunkable. Yeah, well that that is. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, and again, I think it comes back to if we were to look specifically at Corona, um, maybe, again, I'm just guessing here, but maybe the riboflavin content is low. Ah. Um, and so, you know, I've never uh, actually left a Corona out in the sun. That would be kind of, you know, even for a Corona, that might be some beer abuse. Even though if you look at their ads, they're, you know, they got people out on the beach in the sun – yeah, that, that's true. Well, I guess that lime or that lemon can really help out a lot. <laughs> so, so in other words, we've stumped the scientists this week, uh, and uh, we need more data on why certain beers don't get skunked. All right, uh, you've given me a perfectly wonderful uh, reason to travel to Mexico. Uh, for... <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, I, I won't be covering your expenses there. Uh, <laughs> uh, so... What about the color of the beer itself? Does the color of the beer itself have any impact on skunking? For instance, does a, a dark-colored beer get skunked less easily than, say, a light-colored beer? Yeah, well, I did a little bit of research on that, little little data collection on that. Um, and one of the things that uh, I first started off doing was just ask the question, can water uh, attenuate light as it passes through it? And Again, I chose a particular wavelength at 488 nanometers. Um, it happens to be one of the the uh, very intense lines that come from a fluorescent bulb. But when I put about one centimeter of water on top of, uh, you know, to uh, have the light pass through there, it attenuated a 488 nanometer wavelength by about 10%. Um, 
So that's not a huge attenuation, but it does attenuate the light to some extent. Mm. Um, if I took a, a very light uh, logger, probably an SRM of five or so, and uh, put in one centimeter, and it attenuated the light by about 50%. Uh, so it was a there was quite a bit of attenuation um, due to beer. Again, I followed up with that by putting in two centimeters of beer, and it was maybe attenuated sixty percent, not a huge amount more uh, with a larger volume, um, as you might expect. Um, I did not get around to, and I apologize, James, uh, but to running this new castle. It's still sitting over in the lab right now, skunking up the whole place. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I would guess that it also would attenuate the light. But now we have to kind of step back and say, well, um, uh, you know, if the beer is is stopping the light or attenuating the light, that means the light is dispersing its energy into that beer. Um, again, the sensitivity of our noses to this uh, thiol, this MBT, is very, very high. And so if you have a dark beer and you have light passing through the glass into the beer, if that chemistry is happening, you're most likely going to sense that. Um, and again, your, your beer is a liquid, so it moves around. It's not like a flat surface where you could have just the surface become uh, have that photochemistry happening, but it mixes in with the beer. So there may be some protection, but again, as as you know, a darker beer has a much uh, larger character to it, and so it may be masked by some of the richer tones that are in a darker beer. But I would say it could probably be skunked just as easily as a light lager would. Well, it's interesting that on another day, out on the patio on a sunny day, I, I left a little bit of a, a heavy Weizen on the patio in the sun while we were shooting. And you may remember, this is the one that you certified on our IBU podcast. You certified it was only seven IBUs, so it was pretty lightly hopped. But now, unfortunately, they were at different times, so I have to rely on memory. But it seemed to me that I got more of a skunked perception from that lightly hopped beer than the considerably more hoppy um, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Could it be that the the more hoppiness, the more hops that were going on, kind of masked the skunkiness? Yeah. Well, in in the IBU measurement, um, you know, with uh, uh, that measurement, say seven, that's seven um, milligrams per liter. So that's milligrams of an isomerized alpha acid. Uh, when you're talking about the sensitivity of our noses to this MBT. You're talking at least the published value is somewhere around four nanograms, and a nanogram that's uh, essentially a million times less wow. than a milligram. So you have seven milligrams of isomerized alpha acid in there that could be susceptible uh, to this photochemistry leading to that skunky flavor. Again, like you say, there is a masking that can occur. But again, when we smell that skunk, it's a pretty low quantity. Mm. Uh, we just happen to have that big sensitivity to it. And again, it's it's the main reason why propane is is uh, has this as an additive or something similar to it, this mercaptan or thiol uh, added to it so that we'll know uh, real, real soon whenever there's some sort of small leak right. that, uh, that this is a problem. So is there anything else that we're missing that we need to talk about in your research? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really rich topic of science, and uh, I look forward to thinking a little bit more about it. And, again, I'll get you uh, some of this data so that your listeners can actually download it and look look at that data and see if it makes sense to them. Um, but I think the, the take-home is uh, clear glass is not desirable, uh, or, excuse me, colorless. There I go again. Um, and... Uh, the the sort of surprising for me was that blue glass is the second least desirable, mm -hmm. um, and then green uh, would be the uh, not as bad as blue or colorless. Uh, but again, it's easy enough to come up with brown bottles nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, so, oh, I do I do have to mention one other thing is that uh, one of my students, uh, Matt Farron 
had actually done a study similar to this, but he was looking at different brown bottles, and there is some variation between the brown bottles. Uh, for instance, he had one that he had brought back from China, and it was a really thick brown bottle. And, of course, the thicker the bottle, uh, you know, the more uh, protection that you have, the more attenuation of those wavelengths. So not all brown bottles are actually made the same, um, although generally they pretty much are, are your safest bet. So look for the look for the Belgian bottles that are nice and thick uh, to hold in that uh, the extra carbonation pressure. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Or consider cans. Yeah, we didn't talk about cans, but uh, you'd assume they'd be the best of all. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, you certainly aren't going to have any light inside of a can. And again, when you pop the top of a, uh, a beer can, uh, the amount of light that can get through that little hole is uh, is minimal. So, uh, you know, when you're on the porch in the bright sun uh, wearing your suntan lotion and your brimmed hat, you ought to get your, your beer or something like that, too. So. Well, excellent. Well, Brad, this has been fun and and uh, quite informative. Uh, we've proven that we've proven that skunking is a real issue, and uh, we've proven that there is something that you can do about it. That's right. Thank you, sir. Yes, well, thank you, James. It's always a pleasure. Well, thanks again to Brad Sturgeon. I'll post a link to Brad's paper, which is really well put together, by the way, with graphs that clearly show you what's going on with the process. Uh, I'll put that link in the description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com and I'll put the PDF in the RSS feed so that you can download it through iTunes or your other podcast aggregator. It should show up just like a just like an episode. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Please check your email address spelling. Check out our low-tech lagering and decoction mashing DVD on basicbrewingshop.com where you can see Steve, Steve Wilkes, do a single-step decoction mash. And you can follow me through a lager fermentation in the middle of summer where I don't use a dedicated chest freezer. There are also our original DVDs, Basic Brewing Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, where we walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step from boiling to bottling. And in Basic Brewing, Stepping into All Grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. And we got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy them more than one DVD at a time. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. We've also got shirts and hats including our ever-popular Go Forth and Flocculate shirt, which uh, I'm going to send one out today, in fact. Uh, Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Don't Let the Pigeon Stay Up Late and Sprout Master Single Sprouter. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping, and we'll get a little chunk of that. We appreciate your support. That's all until next week. Till then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Don't forget to Twitter. Basic Brewing. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.